reading from the law prior to the sermon text is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 12. Exodus chapter 20, and then after that we will be reading our sermon text, which comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 12. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then in verse 12, we find the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And then for a passage that, ab that uh, applies those thoughts, Jeremiah chapter 29, and we will read the first 14 verses. Jeremiah 29 and verses 1 through 14. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, it said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. <clears throat> so what seems like a hundred years ago, I preached from a first sermon on the fifth commandment, and we talked about some of the things that are expressed in the responsive reading that we did uh, a little while ago. And that is, while the fifth commandment deals explicitly with fathers and mother, obeying your parents. Um, by extension, it speaks to other kinds of relationships involving superiors and inferiors. Now that's very old fashioned language. In modern day America, we don't like to think of anybody as our superior. Um, we like to think that if somebody is our boss or somebody is um, a government official or if somebody's your pastor, that doesn't mean anything. Um, you, uh, we're all equals, and, um, and and so even government officials and employers often don't try to contend against that. They will try to find ways to exercise authority uh, without trying to defend themselves as superiors. And goodness knows, as a pastor, I'm not even going to attempt it. So, nonetheless. Um, I've been away for a while, but you're supposed to laugh when I say something like that. So there you go. But anyway, um, 
Our confession of faith, just for good measure, and our catechism, uh, not only speaks to superiors and inferiors, but also to equals. And so thinking about all of that, we are saying that the fifth commandment it applies to all of the kinds of cultural relationships that we have. And it would do us all well to meditate on the lists of duties that we find um, in the portion of the catechism that we read earlier. It's, um, it's quite convicting to think that scripture teaches that I owe these kinds of duties to my superiors, to my inferiors, to my equals, um, as do each of us. And so it's, it's a convicting uh, thought that these are the duties that we have, and to fail to meet those duties is sin not only against our neighbors, but sin against God. And so in this, we have the Bible's guidance as to how to live in the midst of other Christians. And we also have the guidance of the Bible in terms of how to live in the midst of a hostile world. And as we might expect, not only in our catechism, not only in the passages that we're reading today, but throughout the Bible, there's a lot of guidance with regard to this, guidance that we find by precept and guidance that we find by example. And yet I've found that in the changing world that American Christians find themselves in, I find that we are floundering frequently, unsure how to maintain our footing in a world that's changing beneath our feet. Um, some Christians in the midst of the world in which we are living are angry. Some are nostalgic as they recall better days. Some are fearful about where things are headed. And some are ready to storm the gates, figuratively speaking, of course. In all of these cases, I fear that the church is doing a poor job of bringing Scripture to bear on the kinds of things that we're facing in our world and that are uh, implicated by our duties under the fifth commandment. Now, that's not to say that the Bible doesn't give us lots of examples. Over the course of biblical history, we find God's people, we find believers living under all kinds of circumstances and in all kinds of nations. In Genesis, the people of God were an extended family, the patriarchs and uh, their children, who lived in a pagan land um, and engaged in cultural activities in the midst of a land that they really didn't have the ability to change. They were all pagans, and this was just a family within that land. And so we find all kinds of cultural activity. Um, Abraham, for example, engaging in commerce, among other things, buying uh, some property where he could bury his wife. Um, Abraham, again... Uh, collaborating with his neighbors in building a military force to go rescue his nephew and to take on his enemies. And so we find the people of God in the midst of a pagan land um, dealing with their cultural neighbors. And then they went to Egypt. And Joseph, of course, became the prime minister of Egypt. And so after years of struggle, he actually rose to the very top of the nation and became prime minister, but then we find out that there came to be a pharaoh who did not remember Joseph, and the people of God were slaves in the land of Egypt. And they were slaves, but um, Pharaoh feared them because of their increasing numbers, and yet the ordinary people around them seemed to have an, ad an admiration um, for the Jews. Um, the midwives certainly uh, did not want to accommodate Pharaoh's murderous intentions. And um, generally, from the way they were uh, able to leave, it seems that the ordinary people of Egypt thought uh, frequently of the Jews as having been good neighbors. But they lived once again in a pagan land. And then we find the people of God in Israel. Um, with their own nation, 
and their own nation was a theocracy. And so the worship of God was at the center of the nation. And we might sound, think that that sounds wonderful, but actually it didn't tend to go all that well. As we find a, a, a general path of decay and faithlessness on the part of Israel that ultimately ended in their exile in Babylon. And in the passage that we read, we find them in Babylon, again, in a, uh, under the government of a pagan nation. Interestingly, even though they were a pagan nation, we have an entire book of the Bible, the book of Daniel, that's devoted to remembering uh, Daniel and his friends who worked for the government. Daniel rose to the top of government and did his job so well that when there was regime, regime change, Darius the Mede decided to keep Daniel on. And then his three friends were lower level bureaucrats in the governor, government of Babylon as well. And then finally in the Bible, we find um, the New Testament era with the people of God, again, living in a pagan nation and, the, um, and under the Roman Empire. And so the gospel spread worldwide and yet, while the gospel spread geographically, once again, the people of God were a small minority that really didn't have influence um, in terms of changing things with their neighbors. And so we find in Scripture all kinds of examples that can be helpful to us. Although the struggle in applying Scripture is, there, there are several struggles, but one of them is this. The Bible doesn't describe any period of um, a free society such as ours where there is the opportunity uh, to have influence. Um, we can honor our superiors to use the language of our confession, but in the modern United States we can both honor them, respect them, and throw the bums out when it comes election time. And those were rights that they did not have um, in any of the nations of the Old Testament um, or of the New Testament period. And so um, while there are uh, many types of situations that the people of God lived in that are applicable, the applications can be different because of the levels of freedom that we have uh, that are very different um, from what they had in Bible times. And so uh, with all of this in mind, we want to look at one of those particular uh, times, and that is the time of exile in Babylon. In chapter 29, in the first 14 verses, we see Jeremiah writing a, an official letter delivered by official means to the exiles that lived in Babylon after King Nebuchadnezzar had leveled the city of Jerusalem. And so first of all, I want to speak with you about what I'm calling a bitter pill. A bitter pill. In verse 4, we read, um, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile, whom I have sent into exile, from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then in verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. 70 years. And so it had been, when Jerusalem was destroyed, it had been 800 years since Moses had led them out of Egypt. It had been 400 years since David had established Jerusalem as the capital and Solomon had built the temple. Think about that. Our country is 250 years old, which in some sense may seem like a long time. But the temple was 400 years old. And the nation, the people, had left Egypt and gone to Canaan roughly 800 years ago. And that was the only life that any of these people had ever known. And then Nebuchadnezzar came in a series of sieges of Jerusalem. And in the end, he absolutely leveled the place. The city was destroyed. The, 
um, instruments of the temple that remained were taken off to Babylon to be used, either to be stored or to be used in the worship of pagan gods. Everything they knew had been destroyed. And if that were not enough, the best and the brightest of the nation were chosen by Nebuchadnezzar and his cohort, and they were hauled off. Even very young men, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were probably in their late teens at this point in time, and they were all separated from their families and hauled off to Babylon for training. And so everything they knew had been lost. It was all gone. Now, there are a couple of things that are emphasized in these verses that we have to think about in order to realize what a bitter pill it was they were experiencing, in addition to losing all that their people had ever known. But verse 4 says also that they were in exile because God had sent them into exile. It wasn't just that Nebuchadnezzar was a stronger general than what the Jews could deal with. Nebuchadnezzar was the servant of God in judgment on them because of their sin. And so they weren't just in exile because Nebuchadnezzar was a great general, though he was, but Nebuchadnezzar, the great general, was the servant of God, fulfilling God's purpose and they were in exile because God had sent them. The same thought is expressed at the end of verse 14, when God says, I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And so they were in exile because God had sent them there. It was the judgment of God upon people's sins. The second thing that makes this a bitter pill is that Jeremiah was telling them, yes, they would be restored, but it was going to be 70 years. Seven zero. This is very different. The passage that we read re uh, re refers to prophets that God had not sent. But look at one of those prophets back in chapter 28 and beginning with verse 1. Chapter 28 and starting with verse 1. In that same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring you back to this place. And he goes on and describes that further. So the false prophets were saying two years. Jeremiah was saying not two years, 70 years. Two's very different from 70. And nobody was putting Jeremiah up for man of the year when he said, you're not here for two, or you're not there, Jeremiah wasn't with him. You're not there for two. You're there for 70. What a bitter pill to take. It's going to be 70 years before you come back. Jeremiah was hated so much that they made multiple attempts to kill him. And on one occasion, in Jeremiah 38, they actually threw Jeremiah down into a cistern uh, that had dried up, and they left him there to die. He was rescued later, but that shows the extent to which there was hatred for Jeremiah. Because the false prophet said, two years and it's done, you're back. And Jeremiah said, not two years, 70. And so Jeremiah was not a prophet, uh, not a popular prophet. Um, and so he was not popular because of the delayed return. But second, notice that he was not popular because of the duties required. Look at verses 5 through 7. Um, Build, uh, Jeremiah says to them, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, there's that sending again, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. 
Now, to understand these words, it's important to rec recognize that when you go someplace to live for two years, you go about it in a different way than if you're going there for 70 years. Um, many of us have been students, or you were in the military, or you were with employers that sent you someplace for a brief period of time, and you know, I'm there for two years, and then I'm done, and I'm leaving. And so if you, know, if you think you're only going to be in a place for two years, you don't put down roots. You probably rent a house. You don't buy because you don't want to have to try to sell it after only two years. You want to make friends, but... I'm going to be going in two years. You know, I, I'm not going to be able to maintain these relationships. You may want to get involved in the community that you live in, but two years, I'm moving somewhere else. So why do that? And so you live differently if you think you're a short-termer than if you think that you're going there to stay for a while. And Jeremiah is saying to them, you're going to be there for a while. And so uh, build houses. Plant gardens. Um, raise, don't put off having children. Have children. And, and when they get old enough, marry them off and encourage them to bring some grandchildren to you. Because you're going to be there for 70 years. And so act like your people that are going to be there for a while. When you come back to Jerusalem after 70 years, you want to be a strong people, not a weak people, and therefore... You should be, um, you, you, you should be uh, increasing and not decreasing. Don't sit around waiting for two years. Oh, he must have meant three. Recognize that God has put you there for 70 years and live like it. Become, but buy houses and become a part of your community. Raise children and grandchildren. And so there were duties that were recommended because of the length of time but then I haven't said yet that he gave them the most difficult duty of all in verse 7, where he says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Babylon! They were to seek the welfare of Babylon, and they were to pray for Babylon! They're destroyers. It was the Babylonians that had come down to Jerusalem and leveled it. But now they're living there. And Jeremiah tells them, don't just live there, but seek its welfare. Nebuchadnezzar conquered you. You want Nebuchadnezzar to do well. Because if Nebuchadnezzar does well and you live in his kingdom, you'll do well. That's hard. They wanted to pray for Nebuchadnezzar. They wanted to pray he'd die. He was the one that had destroyed them. And they wanted his destruction. That's what, not what Jeremiah says to them. Jeremiah says, pray, seek the welfare of the city and pray for them. That's hard, isn't it? Some years ago... Um, you may remember a story when, um, uh, when, when he was president, President Trump was going down a wet um, airline ramp. And he kind of was walking funny to get down this slippery ramp. It, was, it had rained. And so some uh, folks I know, Christians and politically liberal, they were excited that President Trump was struggling getting that, down that ramp. They, they said, did you see the way he walked funny? I think he's sick. That's showing signs of some kind of illness. And I said, you believe the president's sick? Yeah, it looked like it to me. Ah, well then you have a duty to pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the application they were looking for. <laughs> They kind of thought of him the way the Jews thought about Nebuchadnezzar. Let me hit a little closer to home. We can all agree with that. They should have pr prayed for Trump. After he took office, um, the current president sort of has fumbled over words as he's been doing his whole career. But he fumbled over words and kind of looked funny on an occasion. He may have been tired or something. But 
I heard folks say, you know, the president kind of looks like he has dementia. He's an old man. You think the president's sick? Yeah, he looks sick to me. Did you hear the way he messed up his words? Ah, if the president's sick. You should pray for him that God will give him his health back. That wasn't the application they were looking for. And yet, Paul in 1 Timothy 2, when Nero was the emperor of Rome, says, pray for the king and for all who are in authority. And he says to pray for them that they will do well. Not because they agreed with them, they didn't. Nero would ultimately put Paul to death. But he says pray for them that the gospel will go forth. Their welfare would be your welfare. So let me make clear what I mean. I mean, when I say that we should pray for our leaders, whether it's the president or whether it's Governor Abbott or whether it's the mayor of our city, I'm not, I've not noticed I didn't say a word about changing any of our views of these people. And if you think I came in here as a liberal to convince you to pray for liberals, you've missed my point entirely. Nothing I've said says change your views. But it is to say that we should seek the welfare of our nation. We should seek the welfare of those around us, even the godless ones around us. Pray that God will change their mind, among other things. So you say, preacher, you're asking for too much. Asking me to pray for people I don't like and agree with. I'm not asking for anything compared to what Jeremiah asked. He had leveled their city. He had destroyed their way of life. And yet Jeremiah says to pray for and seek the welfare of the city. Now we have examples of people that did exactly what uh, we're talking about. And I mentioned earlier that Daniel and his friends actually worked for the government. And they served faithfully. They served well. But that does not mean that they went along with everything. When God told, uh, or when Nebuchadnezzar tried to tell them how they were to pray, uh, Daniel said, you know, I would rather spend the day in a lion's den with hungry lions than to let Nebuchadnezzar tell me, or let Darius the Mede tell me who I'm supposed to pray to and when. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar tried to tell them to, uh, who and how and when they were to worship, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, I would rather spend the day in a fiery furnace than I would like to spend uh, time letting you tell me how to worship. And so there were certainly limitations at which point they would rebel, um, and yet they served faithfully and they served consistent with what uh, Jeremiah says here. I need to move on. And so we not only see a bitter pill, but second, notice with me a better place. In verses 10 and 11, we read, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise, and I will bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so God reminds them that as long as they live in Babylon, they are to uh, seek the welfare of Babylon. They are to buy houses and have families and, and plant gardens and all that sort of thing. And yet Babylon is not ultimately their home. Their home is not Babylon. Their home is Jerusalem. And ultimately God is going to bring them back. They are to seek the welfare of Babylon but they should never get so comfortable in Babylon that they forget that their real home is Jerusalem. It's their forever home. Babylon, like all other nations, was a temporal kingdom. Jerusalem represents our heavenly Jerusalem, and it lasts forever. And so while we live here, when we agree, certainly, and when we disagree in different ways, we are to seek the welfare of our earthly home, but we should not get so comfortable in our earthly home that we forget that our true home is our heavenly home, our new Jerusalem, the place that Christ will ultimately bring us. And so we've seen a bitter pill in a better place. And finally, I would have you to notice with me the believer's position. 
In Philippians chapter 3, and, and verses 20 and 21, we read, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. By his substitutionary death and victorious resurrection, Christ has swept us into the age to come. The age to come has already invaded this present evil age. And we are included by faith, and because of the work of Christ, we are included in the age that is coming. We are citizens both of our earthly city and also of the kingdom that is coming. This means that we can pursue our common interests in this life, our families, our work, our interests that we have, our hobbies. We can pursue our common interests and show care for those who are here, even uh, as we understand that we truly belong to the age to come. And we desire to live well in the midst of this age, that we might also be a part of snatching others up so that they can also be a part of the age that is to come. All of this means that while we are living in two cities, our earthly city and our heavenly city, we can have the confidence that we lose nothing that truly is eternal. The Jews were in Babylon because of the judgment of God. We are in Bryan and College Station as Christians, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom, because we have been brought here by grace. And so we are a part of two cities, the city of man and the city of God, as, as Augustine put it. We are, are a part of two cities, and we know that everything that really counts eternally cannot be lost by us. And that's part of the reason that we are able to live joyfully. And while the reason that God's people through all ages have managed to live joyfully, even in the midst of severe persecutions and even when life was hard. Even today, there are Christians in China, in the Middle East, in other parts of the world where believers suffer intensely for believing in Christ, um, they suffer in ways that we thankfully never have. Even We have much smaller ways of being persecuted. And yet they are able to live joyfully because they understand that there's nothing I have that's truly eternal that I can ever lose. And I will have it for all eternity. We are secure in Christ. And so we desire to promote the welfare of those around us, but we promote the gospel message that will sweep others into his kingdom of grace. Recently, I've been reading in the newspaper where I used to live about a church that uh, meets in a part of a strip mall uh, near where I used to live. Um, they've become noted for using inflammatory language about um, sinful people. Um, we would agree with the people in that church that the things that they are condemning really are immoral. And so we would uh, condemn the same kind of immorality. Uh, one of the things that they have condemned is homosexuality. And they, they have gone so far though to say that every homosexual should be immediately executed. And so they've gotten the attention of the community. Protesters have gathered outside their meeting place and have shown up at City Hall to oppose the existence of this church. Again, none of us would disagree with them over what is sin, but the inflammatory language and, and the harshness is something that I think all of us, or at least most of us, would disagree with. I, I assume all of us. And so we would disagree and use more temperate language because we want people to know that we care for them. People that are guilty of those sins and other kinds of sins 
that we could talk about our people that we care for, that we want to bring the gospel to. Um, we don't want protections enshrined into law as far as who can get married, but we do seek the welfare of the city even as we point sinners. When we say sinners, we mean people just like us toward the heavenly city and the kingdom of grace. Seek the welfare of the city. Honor your superiors, your parents. Hard words here. This hasn't been an easy sermon to preach. Don't get mad at me, please. Give me a chance. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's what Jeremiah said to the Jews who were experiencing something far more difficult than you and me.